the 510-25 game for $5,000. Quick side note, this game played much bigger. It was basically 2550 the entire night. I don't think anyone missed a straddle, and let's just say by the end of the night, I may have put on the triple straddle. You guys are going to have to wait and see that one. First stand of the night, I look down at queen 10 of spades from the cutoff. I make a standard open 3x the $50 straddle, and we are going heads up to a flop with the recursive dragon. He's going to be a common opponent here in this session, and we flop the nuts. King, jack, nine, bang, we flop a straight. Recursive dragon checks it over to me. This is a great board for my entire range. I expect a half pot C bet to come in here. That's what I decide to do. And uh, he has nothing, no connectivity on this board and decides to fold. So yeah, taking down the first hand of the night always feels pretty great. We look down at this next one, ace jack offsuit from the low jack. Remember the $50 straddles on, I make it 3x to 150 and we're gonna get called in two spots, meaning we're going three ways to a flop, which comes ace, ace, six, bang, we flop three of a kind. Back to back bangs, we flop three of a kind and I'm gonna play this one slow in the last hand. We played it sort of fast and the opponent folded. This time I'm gonna try to squeeze out as much value as possible. If you look at the board, it's not really connected at all. Sure, someone could have pocket sixes but there's really no flush draw, straight draws out there. So usually when you're checking behind and trying to trap, you wanna make sure that it's gonna be hard for the opponents to back into a better hand. This is a great board to check behind on. We can get value on the turn in the river versus any worse ace. And maybe someone could catch up on the turn. For instance, if it came the queen of diamonds, and look at that, Kenny catches up with a pair of queens now. You can also see that Dunn is in a cooler situation because he flopped three of a kind as well. And when I check back on the flop, he takes the initiative now and bets out for 150. We have a decision between raising and just calling. If I raise here, it pretty much is gonna squeeze Kenny out with any of his hands, including any queen. I don't think he can call a six or $700 raise here. But if I just call, Kenny might also come along with any queen, any six, any pocket tens or nines. So I'm thinking about how I can make this pot as large as possible. If done as an ace, we're gonna be able to raise him on the river, so I'm not worried about that. I just put in the call. My plan is working to perfection. When Kenny puts in the call for 150 more with the third best hand here in this one, and the river comes a pretty safe five of spades. Kenny checks it once again, and Dunn continues to bet, thinking he has the best hand. Well, newsflash Dunn, we are gonna come in for a raise. The only decision is how large do we wanna go? Common sense would say somewhere around 900 to $1,000 but because I didn't get any value on the flop, I wanna target all of his worst aces that don't have me beat, for instance, ace six and ace five. That'd be a bummer if he had that, but ace seven, ace eight, ace nine, ace 10. So many good hands to get value from. So I decide to go super, super large and polarize here, trying to make it look like some sort of weird bluff, like king jack of hearts, king 10 of spades, something like that, who knows. When I make it $1,500, Kenny pretty quickly gets out of the way, but we squeezed out a little bit more value from him on the turn, and the action's over to Dunn. I think he's in a gross spot. If I was in his shoes, it'd be hard for me to fold here, but at the same time, I'm really only representing very good hands and then a minute amount of bluff, so I couldn't blame him for doing either calling or folding. At the end of the day, though, he's a good player. He decides to put in the call, thinking he has three of a kind. It's going to be hard for me to have him beat. In this spot though, I do, and we are taking down that 4K pot. Let me know down in the comments, do you like me checking back on the flop and just calling the turn? Or would I have gotten more value if I just bet the flop or raised the turn? Let me know down below, but a 4K pot with three of a kind seems pretty great to me. All right, there's a lot to talk about on this next hand. I raised the cutoff with queen jack of diamonds and the dragon puts in the call from the plus one or straddle position. We flop ourselves top pair, which comes queen seven seven with two clubs. He checks it over to me, I go for a C bet and he decides to check raise me. He goes for a sizing that's pretty large as well. He makes it $625, so a little bit over 4X my bet. Now obviously here, if it's just this decision, I would put in the call, but let's think about when he raises this large on the flop, what does that mean about what he's gonna do on the turn in the river? At this point, I've seen him go bet, bet, bet on a few streets, and he was very apt to be putting money in on flop, turn, and river. So calling here on the flop also means I would have to call turn and river if there's no club. That being said, he's calling out of the straddle, so he has all the sevens. I really have none of them except for pocket sevens and maybe a seven suited. So he knows this and his raise makes a lot of sense. Other bluffs he could have here are obviously the club draw like we see he has in his hand. 
And uh, yeah, it's just going to be a lot of value as well. He could also have a hand like King Queen that doesn't decide to raise out of the straddle. But I think it's going to be a lot of random 7x with the two clubs out there, like 7, 6, 7, 5, 8, 7, 7, 9. And then he's going to have some club draws. But I actually decided to fold this here. It might have been a small mistake, but I didn't want to call this flop bet and then have to call the turn and the river. He would have piled it in, and I probably would have been all in by the river. So uh, if I just knew I could call this flop and get to a showdown, I obviously would put in the call. I can't be folding queens that often. But food for thought in the next time I play with the recursive dragon, I might have to call him down knowing he's raising his light as 9-4 of clubs. I just didn't want to have to put in a ton of money on the turn and the river. I can't be calling the flop and then folding turn a river. That makes no sense. So I had to commit on the flop. I decided not to. So let's pick a better spot. I only lose $300 in that hand. All right, queen 10 of hearts now from the $25 blind. I decided to raise it up to $175. The action comes around to Harris on my left, who decides to defend the $50 straddle with queen three of diamonds. Seems reasonable to me. We are going heads up out of position to a flop, which comes 10, 10, 8. Bang! We flopped three of a kind. Already twice now in this short session that we have flopped three of a kind. This time it's basically blind versus blind. I decide to bet out into the $365 pot to the tune of $250. Harris can either call or fold in this spot. Wouldn't blame him for either decision. He decides to put in the call, leading us off to the turn which comes the jack of clubs and the actions on me. First to act here, I could either bet or check. Uh, I think betting has a lot of merit, but there are three clubs out there, so checking also is a good play. You don't want to bet here, get raised, and be put in a tough spot. I'd have to call considering I have some boat outs, but I like check calling here and allowing him to bluff, and if he checks back, I can go for value on the river. That's what I decide to do. If any of you guys would have just bet out here on the turn, probably also fine. Just uh, keep in mind, if you get raised, you're in a gross spot, so uh, pot controlling here. I'm going to check and try to call a bluff. The action's on Harris in this $865 pot, and he's left with just queen high. If he tries to go for a bluff here, it's probably going to be a multi-street one, considering he really doesn't have too many outs on this all-club board. And just like that, he takes up the betting lead and tries to go for a bluff here and bets out for $500. Sensing weakness for me, I could have some hands like ace-king, ace-queen, and maybe I'd fold to a bet, maybe I'd call depending on the suits of my cards. But little does he know, I flop trip tens, I put in the call, and we're off to the river, which comes the ace of spades. Pretty much a brick, unless he was bluffing with a hand like king-queen. I think he might have three bet that preflop, so we can eliminate some combinations of that, but not fully. He could still have some of that as well. I think when I check call the turn, I'm not going to be donking out on the river here, especially when it brings in Broadway. So I start with a check once again and the actions on Harris. Now, if he's bluffing the turn, I think he wants to continue bluffing on the river. He also has a queen in his hand, which blocks hands like king queen, a hand that he's definitely representing. There's $1,800 in the middle. If he's going to bluff here, I like a larger sizing of 1200 to around pot. But instead, he bluffs, which we like to see, but for a small sizing of $500, which kind of puts me in the blender. Obviously, I have three of a kind, so I'm probably going to be putting in the call. I'm just thinking here why he would bet so small. It seems like king-queen is a reasonable hand to do that. And uh, yeah, he could have pocket eights. Maybe he has jack-10 and just trying to squeeze out a little bit more value. At the end of the day, though, it's 500 bucks into a $2,300 pot. I can't be going anywhere. I toss in one chip. That's a call. He shows me queen-high. And we are taking down that $2,800 pot. Let's go. All right, there's two main hands that make up this vlog. And we are stumbling right into the first one of the two. Recursive Dragon raises it up to $150 from the plus two position. Kenny puts in the call. Danny puts in the call with Pocket Ochos. And look at what old Wolfgang has. Pocket Kings. What a sweet, sweet spot from the button. We have a 150 raise, two calls. This is going to look like a squeeze all day, especially from the button, because if anyone puts in the call, I'm going to be going in position. So it's such a great spot to go for a squeeze. Even if I had a hand like Queen Jack of Hearts or maybe a hand like Pocket Sevens, might be squeezing here. Uh, although at Pocket Sevens, I probably would just put in the call and try to set mine. Either way, though, Pocket Kings, obviously I'm coming in for a raise. Let's go large here and make it look super squeezy. I decided to go for a sizing of $700. The action's back over to the Dragon. He's in an interesting spot here where he has a hand good enough to come in for a 4-bet. If you look over at my stack sizing, though, he probably should go around somewhere around 2K. And then if I rip it on him, he'd be in a gross spot. But uh, let's see what he does here when the action's back over to him. He cuts out some black chips, pulls out some 1K blue chips there, and makes it 2.2K. 
around the sizing I would expect him to do. And that cleans up a lot of the other players which back over to me. On the button, in position, what are you guys doing here? Are you ripping it in for $8,000 with Pocket Kings? Are you just calling? Are you folding? Yeah, well, we're never folding Pocket Kings pre-flop, let alone for $8,000. Uh, interesting spot here. I think just jamming it in probably is the best play. If he has hands like Queens or Jacks, he might find a call with them. Ace-King suited, probably going to call as well. But I think calling might get us in some trouble. So I want to see all five cards. If he has aces, so be it. We're going to rip it all in. And I jam for $8,800. He snap calls. No decision point for him. He made up in his mind if I jammed over his $2,200 bet that he was snap calling. And just like that, we are playing an $18,000 pot here in Dallas, Texas. Now what you guys don't see because they pan onto the dealer's beautiful hands instead of looking at the players is uh, the Cursive Dragon asked me how many times I want to run it. What a nice guy. I put a one in my left hand behind my back and a two in my right hand behind my back and I tell him to pick one of the two hands. It's up to him. Whatever he chooses, we're going to do. Usually if it's up to me, I always let the other player decide. He didn't want to decide, so we leave it up to chance. He chooses my left hand. Just like that, we are running it once. Max Payne in an $18,000 pot, and I'm in a great spot to be up huge early. The flop comes pretty clean for my hand, 8-7-6 with two spades. The turn comes the 10 of clubs, not bringing in the backdoor spade draw. You can see he had the king of spades. That would have been pretty gross, but you know what it does bring in? A gutter to a 9. We wouldn't lose. But we would chop, and that would feel almost worse than losing, honestly, if we ended up chopping this hand. And of course, because if there's a gutter to a chop, the dealer's going to put it out there. The nine of hearts. We end up chopping at this point. We don't even know what he has. I turn over my kings, expecting to be shown queens, jacks, ace-king suited, or maybe I sucked out versus aces. Instead, he turns over ace-king offsuit. And I am demoralized. An 18k pot. It was all coming our way until that bad river card. Of course, it could have been an ace. I shouldn't be greedy. He had three cards to scoop and four cards to chop. Of course, one of the four cards come. I tap the table. 18k being chopped in half. And I win $195. My equity in that one pre-flop was probably around $12,000. And uh, instead, I'm getting $195 worth of profit. All right, pretty gross spot in that last one. Kind of how the session has been going so far. But we got to mix it up here. I can't only be playing pocket kings. I look down at jack seven offsuit from the big blind. And Kenny opens it up to 150 from the cutoff. Why am I showing you guys a hand when I have jack seven off? Well, because sometimes you just got to make stuff happen. Kenny's been opening a little bit light from the cutoff. I'm going to three bet him and uh, hopefully he just folds. If not, we'll go off to a flop. Jacks have an offsuit a little bit light, but uh, yeah, it's a live stream. Got to mix it up here. I make it $600 and he finds the fold. Look at that. We're getting it through with Jacks have an off. So if the dealer can't help me out with my Kings versus Ace King, I got to take matters into my own hands with the Jack seven off. Moving right along into the next hand, we are going to battle here with our buddy JD. I say that because I raised Queen-9 suited to 150 and JD 3 bets me to 500. He's done this a few times on the session to other players and mostly they've been folding. This time I decide to defend. I will be out of position. This is a suspect hand. So you probably could choose some better hands to do this with, but uh, it's a live stream. Gotta come in there with Queen-9 of clubs. We're off to a flop which gives me top pair on a straight and heart draw board. I check it over to JD. He's gonna have all the over pairs, set of queens and stuff like that. He bets out here for $350, which is a small 35% pot size bet. Can't be going anywhere with my pair and backdoor straight draw. I put in the call and that brings in the seven of diamonds on the turn. I'm not going to be donking into JD once again. He could have queens and jacks. I check and the action's on him with the ace king of diamonds. He still has two overcards and a gutter to Broadway. Wouldn't blame him for betting here. He decides to exercise some pot control and checks behind on the turn. That brings in the four of diamonds on the river. Decision point for me when he checks back the turn, I could go for value here with my top pair, or I could check it over to JD and let him bluff all of his missed draws. What draws would he bluff here, you might ask? Well, any two hearts would bluff, a hand like king 10, ace king, 10, nine. A lot of hands here would bluff, and if he goes for a bet with a better hand like ace queen or king queen, I'll just call and lose probably the minimum in this hand. I think checking here is by far the best play. That's what I decided to do, telling myself, no matter what JD decides to bet here, I am going to put in the call. It's an $1,800 pot. Anything he bets, I'm going to put in the call, right? 
Well, uh, let's see what we do here when JD rips it all in, covering me $6,300. It's a nearly four times the size of the pot over bet shove. And I know I was saying I was snap calling anything, but this is a little bit ambitious here. He's betting my entire stack, putting me to the test with my suspect top pair. You can see I'm smiling here. I'm cracking my knuckles. It puts me in a weird spot. And uh, let's just think about this real quick. What could he possibly be doing this with here? Hands that make sense on the flop would be pocket queens, pocket jacks, queen jack, and all of his over pairs. Now let's think about it though. Would he ever check any of those hands back on the turn with a lot of draws out there? I don't know. I think a good player like JD will have some mixed strategy, but at the same time, checking behind on the turn with aces, kings, or queens seems kind of scary. What if a 10 comes and I just get there with ace, king? I mean, a lot of weird things can happen, so I think he's going to bet a lot of those combinations. On the river here, it doesn't bring in really anything. Is he really doing this with ace, four of spades? Or maybe ace, four of clubs makes a lot of sense. <sighs> just a tough spot. He has a lot of bluffs. He has a lot of good hands that maybe would have checked back on the turn. And the only thing the four brings in are those ace four suited combos. At the end of the day though, it's a four X over bet. Puts me in a weird spot. I don't have the best queen. Is my nine relevant in this spot? I'm not too sure. What you guys can't see in the moment is how close I am to calling. I wanna toss in one chip so badly and be right here and scoop in this 14K pot. But instead, the size of the pot gets to me. I decide to fold thinking he could have some ace four. He could have aces here that have played in a tricky way, maybe even queens or jacks. Just trying to check back on the turn. I end up folding my cards. He immediately shows the bluff and I don't show too much emotion at the table usually, but when he shows the bluff, I hit the table pretty hard with my fist. I have a smile on my face though. I'm just more pissed off that I didn't call that bluff. I had a hunch he was bluffing there. It was just a great sizing by him to get it through. I'm watching you, JD. Next time, though, you go for that huge overbet, I'm going to be more apt to put in the money. All right, this next hand done raises it up to $150 from the low jack. Danny puts in the call with pocket tens. The action's on me from the cutoff. I look down at ace king offsuit and I decide to come in for a raise. Makes a lot of sense in this spot. Want to get Danny out of there. Want to get heads up with one player. And the action's back over to Dunn. We have around 5k in our stack and Dunn decides to raise it up to $1,500. That's a four bet. That's pretty strong at this point, but I have a good hand. Even if he has queens or jacks, we're pretty much flipping. Of course, we don't want to see kings or aces, which he definitely could have in his four betting range. The action's back over to me and five betting always looks super strong. But at this point, I can't just call 1500. I'd have to go all in or fold and I'm never folding ace king offsuit on a live stream this shallow. So I decide to put it all in and he snap calls me. We turn over our cards and then we decide to run it once, obviously. The flop gives him a little bit of hope with the king of clubs in his hand. The turn seals the deal. We are chopping this pot. 11.6K, it was a big one, but uh, at the end of the day, we are both winning 120 bucks. All right, in this next hand, Harris raises it up to $150. Kenny's in the small blind with a beautiful ace, king of diamonds. Decides not to three bet, instead puts in the call. And uh, luckily for me, I decide not to three bet here with jack 10 of clubs. That would have gotten me into a rough spot versus Kenny. Instead, I just call, putting in that call over my $50 straddle. We're going off to a flop, which gives me top pair, but it gives Kenny the nut flush draw. He checks and I check it over to Harris. Not a great board for his exact hand or range, so he wisely checks behind. That brings in the deuce of diamonds, the gin card for Kenny, giving him the nuts. And he continues to slow play and checks it over to me. When the action checks through on the flop and Kenny checks again, it looks pretty weak. I think I have the best hand. And uh, I want to get value versus any hand like ace king, but if he had only one diamond, for instance, ace king offsuit, uh, yeah, definitely want to get value from that. I bet out for $300, which I think makes a lot of sense. And Kenny puts in the call. He continues the trap, slow playing here and uh, giving me the rope. The river now comes the ace of spades and the actions on Kenny. Will he check it over to me once again or will he now go for a bet? Pretty good bet from Kenny because I was probably going to be checking behind, but instead he bets out for $600. Let's just think about his line. He calls preflop, checks the flop, calls the turn and leads out on the river. That could be some sort of ace, maybe like ace five, ace nine, ace eight. Is this ever a hand like king queen offsuit with a king or queen of 
diamonds? I mean, yeah, that could be a bluff. $600 here to win $1,600. I'm not getting the best price exactly, but donking out on the river seems a little bit strange. So if he hit his ace, he's going to have to prove it. I put in the call and he turns over the nut flush. So yeah, definitely took me by surprise. Now I know that Kenny plays ace-king suited in a weird way. Food for thought, moving on to the next hand. All right, we've kind of been getting steamrolled in these last few hands, just nothing really going our way. We finally pick up a good one, the ladies, and I decided to come in for a three bet over a raise from Danny, and uh, my three bet clears the field, everybody folds, pretty, pretty dumb. You finally get a good hand, want to get value, and it's unfortunate Danny just has the ducks there and can't continue. Another unfortunate spot, Dunn raises it up with ace-king offsuit to 150. I three bet him with a good hand, ace-jack offsuit, you guys might be thinking, why am I three betting ace jack off? Well, Dunn could be raising a lot of other hands like 10 9 suited, jack queen suited, hands that I'm ahead of, so gotta be three betting. Comes back around to Dunn, he has a hand that could definitely be four betting, and that's what he decides to do, and of course, I have to find the fold. Just uh, pretty unfortunate these last two hands. I have queens, I three bet everyone's fold. Now I uh, decide to three bet myself and uh, done four bets me and I have to fold. That's how poker goes sometimes. You just have to battle. You know what else you can do to help change your luck? Put out the $100 straddle. That's what I decide to do in this next one. And I get rewarded with a decent hand, eight nine of clubs. Safine makes it 250 preflop. I defend, I'm not putting the 100 out there and then folding for another 150 bucks. We're going off to a flop, which gives me two overs and a gutter to the straight. It comes seven five deuce with two spades. I check it over to Safine who quickly checks it behind. And that brings in the nuts, the six of diamonds. Bang, we turn the nuts straight. Just like that, the poker gods reward us in our $100 straddle hand. There's a $600 pot. I have the nuts. I probably should be betting when Safine checks back on the flop. I bet off for $400, and of course he folds. That's just the way my night's going, I guess. All right, the last hand of the night, the big kahuna. I have my hood on. You know it's going to be a gangster hand here. I have the $200 straddle on. Yes, I put on that $200 straddle. I already announced the table. This was my last hand of the night, regardless if I win, lose, or fold. Whatever happens, my last hand, so I put the $200 straddle out there. Keep in mind, this is a 10-25 game. So yeah, a lot of things have to work in our favor here to put that on. And uh, let's see how this hand plays out. I'm not going to look at my hand until all the action comes around to me. For suspense, of course, JD looks down at a great hand from the cutoff and makes it $500. The action's on Safine from the small blind, and he should be 3-betting here. I like a sizing of around 2 k Let's see what he decides to do with the ace-queen suited. Great sizing from Safine, 2.1k. Everyone gets out of the way and the action's back over to me. I peel my card slowly. I first see the ace of diamonds. What a great sight. Followed by the king of clubs, the poker gods. Reward you when you straddle. It's a fact. Obviously, I'm going all in. Look at that. I announce like a wolf. I howl to the table. I'm all in. And slide all of my chips forward. I'm stoked. This is the last hand of the night. 5.6k in there. This is my chance to win a large one. And get back all those chips I was supposed to win versus the recursive dragon when he chopped that gross hand when I had kings and he had ace king. Let's see if we can win a large one here. Safine probably just has to call off for 3.5k more. I'm super shallow at this point. JD finds the fold. Actions back over to Safine who asks for a count. After he sees it's only around 3k more, he puts in the call. And we are going off to a runout. How many times are we running this, you might ask? Well, Safine's a player that only wants to run it once, which I'm fine with. I'm a huge favorite in this hand. The poker gods are on my side. Dealer, put out this flop. Let's wrap this hand up, and I'm going to go home a $7,000 winner on the last hand of the night. The board comes 4-5 queen. No. Oh, no. Queen. We go from a huge pre-flop favorite to a 92% dog in this hand. How gross is that? We're going to need to see a king on the Turner River. The seven of spades is not what we want to see. And the river, come on, dealer, one time comes the eight of diamonds. How gross is that? Two huge spots where we had huge equity against the recursive dragon. Now against Safine, I finally get it in in the $200 straddle. A no-brainer shove. We just find ourselves in a dream spot only for him to want to run at one time. And then, of course, scoop that 12K pot. I'm leaving with my tail between my legs, that $5,000 loss. I mean, it's not massive. It won't cripple my bankroll. But uh, I should have won around 20K in this session. Instead, I'm losing $5,000. Holy shit, this might be the most tilted I've been 
post live stream in a while. Of course, you guys just saw that brutal hand at the end. I think it was a 10K or 11K pot. Ace King loses to Ace Queen. We put the $200 straddle in, get rewarded with the Ace King. I was gonna offer the run it twice. We probably would have chopped then, but instead we get scooped. And earlier on, remember, we had that great spot, Kings versus Ace King, and we chopped versus the stupid straight that gets there. Also could have made a great hero call there with the Queen 9 suited against JD. Overall, a very tilting session. We lost 5k. I didn't want to top up later on in the session another 5 or 10 grand. I just wasn't feeling pretty great after the Kings versus Ace King hand. But I uh, gotta know your limits. And uh, 5k loss doesn't feel great. But at least we got it in in the good spots. And uh, the Poker Gods did not reward us tonight. But as always, next time, if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up. Leave me some run good comments down below for the next one. Good luck on the felt, you guys. I hope everyone runs better than I did tonight. Uh, and as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Peace.